This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review and say hello to my little friend right here. This is the iPhone 6 Plus 5.5 inches. It's Apple's first phablet and we're going to look at it now. So here it is finally the iPhone 6 Plus after rumors that said yes there would be a really big iPhone but it wouldn't ship for months or something like that. Well it actually came out on September 19th 2014 along with the iPhone 6. 6 not plus. We have a 6 and a 6 plus. This is the 6 plus review. 5.5 inches. Hard to get at launch time. I don't know if Apple didn't make enough of these or if that many people are just chasing them down, whatever it is, but I like big Android phones, so I'm absolutely fine with this. And you can see at the size in my hand, right? It's it's absolutely not so bad at all. Now, I do have pretty big hands, and the, the iPhone 6 Plus lends itself to discussion about hand size suddenly in a funny way. But being almost six feet tall, and, you know, I got long fingers, good-sized hands, it's fine. This is going to be a real shocker to those of you who are using the iPhone Five or the 5S, which had only a 4-inch display, a very compact design, but thicker design. It has to be someplace to put the internals. It's either going to be bigger as a plane, or it's going to be thicker to fit those internals. But anyway, if you're coming from the 4, this, this is going to feel like a shocker. If you were somebody who was an iOS person, you went over to Android because you liked those big screens, then you came back and said, well, now there's big screens on the iPhone, I'm going to go for that, you probably won't be so bothered by the screen size. Obviously, the nice thing is, is, well, movies look great games look great web pages are easy to see without pinch zooming so there's a whole lot of good things that go along with this and you get landscape functionality now this still runs iphone apps not ipad apps even though it's maybe encroaching on the ipad mini and ipad mini with retina display those are 7.9 inches versus 5.5 inches but still you get some obvious concessions to the screen real estate that's available 1920 by 1080 full HD 1080p whatever you want to call it that's what it is finally Apple has a full HD display here 401 PPI pixel density 326 is what Apple says is about the point where humans can no longer discern individual pixels using a phone in a normal distance with the naked eye. So this obviously exceeds that. Now these days Android phones like the LG G3 and the upcoming Samsung Galaxy Note 4 are getting into 2K resolution displays even higher over 2000 pixels across the longer end. But you know what? I, I own an LG G3. I love it. I can't say that I can tell you that it looks any less pixely or any sharper than my full HD phones. So I wouldn't obsess too much on that. Some of it is just specs war. 1080p and a 5.5 inch display is just awesome. Plus Apple has improved the display. Every year they do this, an IPS display, and they have what they call dual domain pixels. It's supposed to increase side viewability, and I can tell you in person it does. The camera may have trouble due to glare and things like that showing it to you, but really very good, very wide viewing angles, and if you're sharing content and two people are sitting down and actually watching a movie, which is something you might do with something this big, well, that does make a difference. Also, as they get the substrate even closer to the surface of the glass, more than ever, the icons look like painted on the glass. It's just kind of surreal and beautiful and iPhone-esque. As ever, 500 nits of brightness, so a very bright display, and also one of the most outdoor viewable displays. This and the higher-end Nokia Lumias that have their outdoor viewability option really are some of the best for outdoor use. As Samsung Galaxy S5 can do a pretty good job. I expect the Note 4 will do better than even the Note 3. But with those, you really get maximum brightness when, only when you have auto brightness enabled, which I'm loath to do because it's so darn dim indoors unless you're in a really bright office. So I'm always going outside with my Galaxy S5 and then switching off auto brightness or suddenly, or on rather, or suddenly just having to slide that slider up to see it. With this, you just go outside, you can see it just fine. As the usual auto brightness function that you can fine tune with the slider as well. So while we're looking at landscapey things right here, some apps support landscape, some don't, even among Apple's built-in apps. I suppose is where they thought it made sense, maybe where they had time to develop it or not. Third-party apps is really up to them. For example, we have the CNN app on here, and it's already been updated to use the two screens right here, so we can scroll through our content on this side and then play our video or read the article on this side. So, very useful. Now, if we switch to portrait mode, it looks more like your conventional presentation of the article. There it is, and if we go back home, you see the usual thing that you would on any iPhone. Speaking of any iPhone, that gets into the fact that applications do have to be updated to take advantage of the higher resolution display. Now, with iOS, typically the ecosystem, you see apps updating very quickly, so I would expect that, unless you're using some obscure app by some little developer who hasn't really updated anything in a year or two. Other than that, 
they should come quickly. Until they do, though, for example, Gmail. Gmail is like Gmail for the blind now. It's exactly the same screen representation you'd see on an iPhone 5S, only stretched out bigger here. So, yeah. Come on, Google. Hurry up. Get it done. I know it's not in your best interest, maybe, but go ahead and do it. Anyway, for built-in applications, for example, weather. This is what you see in landscape mode as opposed to traditional, less exciting view right here. Even things like the clock have been tweaked. So there's our world clock view when we're in landscape mode. Isn't that nifty and visual cool? Huh? And there's our traditional view there in portrait mode. Now, for something like the web browser, the real benefit here is you're going to see a bit more text than you will on the iPhone 6, certainly more than the iPhone 5S, uh, but everything's going to be bigger, so you don't have to pinch zoom so much. And we have room for this nifty new keyboard over here, which has cut, copy, paste, access to voice dictation, your emoticons, all sorts of stuff like that. And it works as well as ever. I still wish that there would be a comma here at the root level, but you can't have everything. By the way, this is iOS 8, so you can now install third-party keyboards like Swipe and other popular keyboards. Though Most of them don't seem to have quick access to the dictation or voice command feature. And there's our home page right there. And things are reasonably readable if you have sharp eyes. And this is the desktop view. This is very, very easy to read right here without having to pinch zoom in, which is pretty cool. I know those of us who have been using an iPhone 5S and constantly zooming in if it's a desktop site can appreciate that. And let's compare this to the iPhone 6 with the 4.7-inch display lower resolution so you can see how much you see on screen. And lo and behold, there is the, obviously, the iPhone 6 below the smaller screen here. You're seeing about the same amount of stuff on screen. The difference is it's larger and more readable initially without having to pinch zoom on the iPhone 6 Plus. So it, Apple always is into the idea of making something that's, well, pretty viewable and easy on the eyes rather than doing, say, the Windows 8 way of having resolution be crazy high or something like that for Windows 8 desktops at first when Windows 8 came out. They're keeping things pretty readable. So that gets to the fact, how good are your eyes? If your eyes are not really awesome, you're probably going to like the iPhone 6 Plus better because things are, well, more legible initially without having to zoom in and out. For mobile sites, obviously, this is going to matter less. Now, for an application like iBooks here, you're getting a lot more text on screen potentially. I have the font size set towards the smaller end of things. I have pretty good eyes, at least with the help of my eyeglasses right there. Lots of text. It's kind of more like reading a book or reading on a tablet as opposed to on the iPhone 5 where it seemed like you read one paragraph and then had to swipe to scroll. And let's compare that to the iPhone 6 so you can see. Now you're getting plenty more on the iPhone 6 too, but you can see the difference right there. So for those of you who are avid readers and you just hate constantly swiping pages, there's an advantage there. The iPhone 6 is 326 PPI versus the 401 on the iPhone 6 Plus. Honestly, both of these look equally lovely and sharp. So in, in terms of reading text quality, they're both really good. So how about performance? This has Apple's new A8 CPU. That's a dual core 1.4 gigahertz CPU. It is a 64-bit CPU, 1 gig of DDR3 low power RAM. Inside Now, don't worry about dual-core versus quad-core so much, because typically Apple's recent dual-core CPUs have matched, say, the Snapdragon 800-801 series when it comes to performance, even though those are quad-cores. Geekbench 3, you got it right here, 1608 for a single-core, where around 1,000 so far is the best we've seen on high-end Android smartphones running on a Snapdragon 800-801, you know. Multi-core, 2877, so... As always, Apple does a great job with their A8 CPU, just like they did with the A7 CPU. Good performance here. 3 d Mark Ice Storm Unlimited, 17,601. That's, that's pretty good. We've seen some Android phones reach maybe 500 points higher. Obviously, you're looking at pretty much comparable performance there, according to 3 d Mark, which, well, measures 3D performance. Sun Spider, the... JavaScript test, 364. That's where lower numbers are better. That is one of the best scores we have ever seen on a phone. That's about like you would see on a desktop, so quite good. 
as ever, iOS is very fast and fluid. You're not going to really see it lag. Apple does a very good job of managing memory and ma managing applications there. You get a couple of other new things with iOS. You get some notifications here that are actionable. I don't have any, unfortunately, right now. But if you have, say, a new email there, a text message, an iMessage, something like that, you can actually reply in line, which is pretty nice. They have the new Health app. Mm, it's not doing so much yet, but we look forward to it actually having some more features and more compatibility with existing health applications on board. And of course, Apple Pay is coming. It uses the NFC chip that's built into this guy for wireless payments when you're at the store. Looking around at 7.1 millimeters, so both the iPhone 6 and 6S are skinnier than the iPhone 5S. Uh, and they have to be, honestly, because they're bigger phones. And when you're reaching around and it's a hard straight edge device, it can be hard to hold. So if you're gonna go thin, you're gonna go comfortable. Sort of like the iPod Touch. We have the elongated buttons here because they're so skinny and small. You've got to give them some more surface area, make it easier to use them. The usual ringer lock right over here. Nothing up top. On the side, we have the power button. Now, this is not unlike a lot of big Android phones. And there's a reason why big Android phones go with this kind of arrangement. It's because when you're holding it with one hand, you really can't reach the top to get to the power button very easily. Though HTC remains kind of stubborn in putting their power button up top on their HTC One M8 flagship smartphone. Nano SIM card slot there with the usual pokey hole tool where you put it in your SIM card and on the bottom the lightning port. The single mono speaker, yes just because it got bigger Apple did not see fit to squeeze it. Second speaker in there. 3.5 millimeter audio jack, microphone hole right there. We have a secondary microphone on the front face. Speaking of the front face, up here on the front we have the 1.2 megapixel or 720p eyesight camera, f2.2 lens, backside illuminated sensor, as well. Obviously your earpiece here. I've had no trouble with the size of the phone when making phone calls in terms of earpiece and mic alignment. It hasn't really affected call quality in the least bit. In fact, call quality on this has been very good. By the way, this phone supports HD voice. Now here's the deal with HD voice. It has to be HD voice to HD voice enabled phone for that to work to get that higher quality voice codec and on the same carrier. So if you're a Sprint customer, you have to call another Sprint customer. Verizon, you got to call Verizon customer. It also supports XLTE for faster LTE. It uses channel bonding to do that. And another neat thing for you Verizon people is Verizon just enabled voice over LTE for the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus when it came out. For that, that works for any call. You don't have to be calling another Verizon phone or anything like that. That just means that it's going to use LTE for voice. It won't use your minutes, don't worry, or anything like that, or count against your data bucket. I mean, yes, it will use your minutes. It doesn't count against your data bucket, excuse me. But you're going to be able to surf and talk at the same time, which for Verizon customers on CDMA networks, well, that's a pretty cool thing because the iPhone doesn't have extra antennas to enable the old 1X network at the same time as LTE, so cool there. 8 megapixel camera back here, backside illuminated sensor, auto HDR. It has large sensor pixels, 1.5 pixels on the back so that's more light in sort of like the HTC approach the two-tone flash right there a little ambery a little white so you get balanced flash colors on it and the back it's kind of a simple slab except for well the antenna lines right here which some people say reminds them of the HTC one haha <laughs> Apple copied HTC but I think it's also kind of reminiscent of the iPhone 5 design where you had the glass plates right here and the metal body, so there is some design continuity going on at the same time. I do think this design looks more elegant on the iPhone 6. What can you do? They kind of just took the iPhone 6 and they stretched it out to make the 6 Plus though. It's still a very premium, gorgeous, anodized aluminum kind of phone, and once again available in space gray, which is what this one is, silver, which will have a white face, or gold, which also has a white face. It's still a good looking phone, certainly it is. There have been a lot of abuse tests already on the net, people dropping them, tossing them around, hammering them, you get the idea. So far for drop tests, it's survived pretty well, which is impressive, including waist-high drops onto cement, so I'm not saying you should go do that, but it's nice to know. Even the curved glass here on the edges, just like we've seen on some Nokia phones, obviously it's going to hit glass first if you drop it on the face, it seems to survive. It doesn't seem to do well if you hit it with a hammer. Don't hit it with a hammer. Some people have claimed that the phone is slippery. I review a lot of phones with a variety of surface finishes, including the LG G3 right here. Really slick back. 
This is made to look like metal, but it's really plastic. I love this phone. It has a great curve. It fits in the hand. It is super duper slippery. I'm always tossing it like a bar of soap. I don't actually find this too slippery. The anodized metal surface is a little bit less slick, and it's thin enough that you can kind of get it into your palm and feel grippy. But, you know, cases are important. And on a mobile tech reviewer website, we'll be reviewing boatloads of cases for this thing. Apple sells the leather case. This one is 50 bucks. They also, for $10 less, have one that is a silicone case. This adds on very little thickness and weight. This weighs just about nothing. Soft suede on the inside. It gives it a little more grip. Personally, I, I think I could use it even grippier. The nice thing, this will go in and out of a pocket without being really hard to, to do. It's just not that super grippy. But then there's also third-party cases like this. This is Best Buy's own genuine insignia case. Now, their, their own house brand cases don't tend to last so long, but it's only 15 bucks. It's clear. It doesn't add much weight on at all, obviously, because it weighs just about nothing. It doesn't add much bulk. You can still see how pretty the iPhone is. And this is the grippiest thing in the world. Let me tell you, if you have skinny jeans, it probably will be hard to get in the pocket. But if, if you feel like you're fumble fingering this when you're holding it with one hand and trying to do the whole one-handed thing and have the whole weight of the phone back here, something like this. Get one of these grippy cases. Speaking of one-handed, well, Apple has this. I don't know. You can call it a collusion. You can call it cool. That's up to you. Double tap on the home button right there, and it just brings everything lower down where your thumb probably is. So there it is. We've seen Samsung phones that not only bring things down, but shift them to your choice of the right or left side, depending on whether you're right or left-handed. But it does actually do the job for those of you who are trying to just, you know, get the stuff that's on the screen like that. Obviously, the keyboard is going to be within range of most people's thumbs using this. I suspect most people are just going to, well suck it up and say, I'm going to use this with two hands. Really, it is a two-handed device. That's all there is to it. And while we're doing some comparisons, this is the LG G3, and you can see our Geekbench 3 results there, which are actually lower than the iPhone 6 Pluses. 2K display, not really super bright. I love my LG G3. This is my personal phone right here, but brightness is not one of its strong points. Anyway, size-wise, you can see LG did an amazing job of getting 5.5 inches into the smallest possible phone. It is not as tall. In terms of width, they are pretty darn close. In terms of thickness, they both taper, so it's a little bit hard to tell there. But the LG G3 has that nice curve that actually feels good in your hand right there. So it's a nice phone to hold on to. If we put it on the table right here, you can see the LG G3 is actually quite a bit thicker there. They just hide it well because of the thickness of the back. Now, some of you may find that ergonomic. Like I said, it kind of sculpts and fits in your hand, but there it is. Now we have the Samsung Galaxy Note 3, about the same dimensions as the upcoming Galaxy Note 4, and you can see it too is thicker. Samsung does make a darn skinny phone there, but not quite as skinny. But in Samsung's favor, it still has a removable back, a removable battery, and a slightly larger 5.7 inch screen. They've done a good job of really not taking up too much space other than allowing for the screen itself. And here they are side by side. You can see the iPhone 6 Plus is a little bit taller even than this. Not as big as something like the Nokia Lumia 1520, which is a 6-inch Windows tablet, but still bigger. One thing that is nice is the iPhone is a bit narrower, and you'll notice that when you're holding it because it means less of a palm stretch. Just a little bit, but it's there. And the Samsung Galaxy S5 right here. The, I would call this the mainstream for Android phones. You know, the 5 inchish kind of size right there. And again, Samsung does a very good job of making a compact device. And of course, it's going to be smaller. Not wildly smaller, say, compared to going from the iPhone 5 to the iPhone 6 Plus or something like that. But it is smaller. Speaking of the iPhone 6, we'll hold it up again so you can see it. And the iPhone 6 is about the same size as the Galaxy S5. So there's the difference in your hand. Now, I know you Android people particularly, but probably some of you Apple folks too are going to be saying, why in the name of God did they have to make the phone so tall? What are they doing with that space? Well, you can check out iFixit. They always have teardowns. And you can see that every millimeter is crammed with components in here. And particularly, big phone, they put in a big battery. Nobody's going to complain about that, I don't think. Longer battery life is, well... Just about one of the most awesome things there is. 29, 15 milliamps of power in here. So that's a pretty darn big battery, bigger than the Galaxy S5. Now, the LG G3 and the Note, they managed to pack some pretty darn big batteries in there too. But what it means for our iPhone 6 Plus is, depending on how you use it, for you folks who are moderate, 
not constantly glued to your phone kind of people, you probably get two days of use on a charge. Significantly greater battery capacity, almost double the capacity of the iPhone 5S. Of course, this is powering a much larger display too, so that is going to use some of the power. And battery life is dependent on how much screen on time you have. If you're making calls with the screen off, obviously, if you're playing music even over AirPlay using wireless or just with your headphones, you're going to get longer battery life. If you are watching movies, actually, I found that streaming full HD videos. I was streaming Amazon Prime Instant Video on this, Netflix, and it actually did really well. I watched a two-hour movie, and I used about 10% of the battery on it, so pretty darn impressive. Overall, that is one of the benefits of the phone right here. Great battery life. They are filling this up. A good section of this is battery internally. Battery is sealed inside, the usual unibody design. You're going to have to take it in. What they're going to do is they're going to unscrew two little pentalobe screws down here, and they're going to use a screen sucker, and <laughs> there's some adhesive here, pop it off, and then replace the battery for you, should you ever need to do that. But if you're one of those people who every two years gets a new iPhone, you won't reach that point anyway. The battery will last you that long without diminishing in terms of charge duration does charge pretty quickly. It is a big battery, so this takes longer to charge than the iPhone 6. Duh, it's going to. It's a lot more capacity. It's 1,100 milliamps more inside, but still pretty quick. It, it's not really lagging behind Qualcomm's quick charge devices in terms of charging time, which is nice to see. The other thing you get on this is optical image stabilization for the camera, which you can laugh, but you know, on a windy day with something that acts like a sail, that's not a bad thing. Now, optical image stabilization really means that this lens is floating inside of here so that if you move, if you shake, if you've had too much Red Bull, it's okay. It will take care of you there. You won't have a jittery, nasty, blurry photo. This does not fix your two-year-old running around really fast or your cat being hyper. It doesn't stabilize the things you're looking at. It only stabilizes the camera and you. Got that? Now, some people say, oh, well, that's nice, but I'm pretty steady-handed there. You know, I have a gin and tonic, and I'm mellow. No, it's not just about that. Optical image stabilization actually allows it to use slower shutter speeds. You can actually go for lower ISOs, things like that. So you actually may get somewhat better picture, too, with optical image stabilization. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't mean it's going to blow the socks off the iPhone 6 camera. It actually doesn't, but a little bit better, I would say it is. And Apple's finally adding some features in here. Uh, you've got your usual swipe. You can do a photo. You can do a video, slow-mo video. You can go to 120 or even 240 frames per second for really serious stuff. you got time-lapse. You can make it go hyper-fast as well. The usual square photo versus regular photo, pano, auto HDR, easy to turn on and off there. Control your flash right there. You've got a timer front or rear camera, switching to the front or rear camera, and visual effects right there, a bunch of them. If you say, I ah, forget it, I don't want anything, just tap that again. And here are some of the photos that we took. Really very pretty, and we'll splice in the full size of these so you can see them. And that was kind of a reverse depth of field test. I wanted to see how it did with the foreground blur, because honestly, you still don't get that much depth of field on any mobile camera. I don't care how nice it is, but really gorgeous level of detail. And we'll splice that in so you can see. I found it was a little over eager to do auto HDR and honestly it did better without the auto HDR on a lot of the time but you can pick and choose it'll save both files and there's something taken in very low light with a a lot of contrast and actually maintain the detail in this fur so really nice camera yes 1080p video at 60 frames per second slow-mo time-lapse you name it you bet and there's a whole bunch of third party camera add-on, so you can get really creative with this, and I'm sure people will. Is it the very best camera on the market? No, it's not, and I know you Nokia, Lumia, people are going to be jumping up and down talking about your cameras because they are really pretty awesome, but is it one of the better cameras on the market? Yes, it is, and as ever, it's easy to shoot with. You don't get all the, the manual control that you would, though, on some Android phones, and some of you may miss that, but I find most of the time iPhone cameras actually just do the right thing. Now, like I said, you got to wait for your app to be updated for the new resolution in iOS 8 if you want to look really sharp. Apple makes it a little easy. We're in the App Store right now, apps and games for iPhone 6. So the things that have been updated most recently, well, here they are. 
so you can figure it out. One of them is Asphalt 8, and we are going to check that out now to see how gaming is on this big screen phone. So here we are in Asphalt 8, and yes, this is one of the reasons why some of you want a big screen phone. This is like way cool. Everything is big and easy to see. iOS games tend to have very good quality graphics, so you can really enjoy them on a large screen here. At six ounces, the phone is not too heavy to hold for gaming, at least not in my opinion. Hey, go to the gym if you think six ounces is too heavy for gaming. It's not. So great experience right here. Obviously the performance is top notch too. The A8 CPU well does the job nicely. So that's Asphalt 8 running on the iPhone 6 Plus. All right, let's talk pricing and specs. Now we're actually putting this at the end because let's face it, if you've been interested in this phone, you've probably been all over Apple's website and you've got the specs memorized. But just in case you don't, LTE 4G, uh, the model that's sold by most carriers in the U.S. has it on 16 bands. Wow, that's an incredible number of bands. If you buy the Verizon one, they have to sell all their 4G LTE phones unlocked. Just a little tip there. Of course, you may not be able to get away with doing that unless you have some kind of contract with them. Apple Store might sell it to you. T-Mobile one, obviously, if you pay full retail for it and you buy it from an Apple Store, that one's also unlocked. Uh, it will work on AT&T. T-Mobile and other GSM carriers will not work on Verizon or Sprint. Sprint people, there's a special model just for you. That has to do with Sprint's channel bonding over different bands for LTE. So you guys actually do everything just a little bit different there in terms of model. Anyway, pricing $750 for the 16 gig. 64 gig is the new 32 gig. There is no 32 gig, so that's your next step up. Adds $100, $850 in other words. And then there's 128 gig at the top and now, and that one is $950. You heard that right. That's full retail. That's about the price of a MacBook Air. Yeah. What can I even say there? That is what it is. People are willing to pay. A lot of you are going to pay, pay this on some kind of payment plan or you're going to get it on a contract and you're going to pay a lot less. Typically $299, $399, and $499 on contract for this bad boy. Now to put it in perspective, uh, a lot of our U.S. carriers were selling the Samsung Galaxy Note 3 when it came out for $750 full retail also. So phablets are fabulously expensive products. If you're thinking that's terrifying, the iPhone 6 is $100 less. So actually not that much less either. In terms of specs, dual band Wi-Fi 802.11ac, Bluetooth 4.0. It has NFCs for Apple Pay. It's not for anything else. Sorry. Not that anybody's found a whole lot of other things to do with NFC that's really exciting. GPS with GLONASS inside as well. Now, those of you who watch our channel know I use the Samsung Galaxy Note, Note 2, Note 3 uh, since the beginning. A lot. I'm used to big phones, so I'm okay with this. Will you be okay with this? I suggest you try it. And if you get one, use it for several days and see if you get used to it, too. I know there's a big shock at first if you're coming from a small phone, but you might find that you find ways to use it that work for you. If you got skinny jeans and nothing but, well, I hope you have a purse or a merce, a man purse there for you fellas. Uh, beyond that, is it a really nice phablet or big phone? Yes, it is. Is it what a lot of Apple people have been waiting for it. Probably so, because one of our most popular videos on our channel, surprisingly, was the iPhone 5S versus the Samsung Galaxy Note 3. Like, it was David versus Goliath there, right? But obviously, some of you are very interested in the big screen Apple product. It's lovely. If you are indeed interested in it, it's fun. It's awesome for movies particularly, and for games, as you saw. So there it is. If you got the pockets, if you got the cash, if you got the hands for this, I recommend it. So there it is, Apple's first big screen iPhone. In general, it goes the same way every year. The current generation of iPhones, the new ones that are available, are the best yet. And in this case, you got your choice now. 4.7 inches, 5.5 inches. Obviously, the 5.5 inch has merit, especially for those of you who are saying, ah, I don't need an iPad mini anymore, or I want to get rid of it, something like that. I don't want to carry a tablet as well. I get cellular data, I get calls right here. It fits in a roomy pocket if you have cargo pants, something like that, dress front slacks if you're a guy. 
certainly a purse if you're a woman. So if you like living large, definitely worth it. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.